Hello, I'm Kenshin. Welcome to Talking History. Today's historical discussion is about the Red Guards of the Cultural Revolution in China. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share, and don't forget to turn on the notification bell. Thank you. As many of you may have seen in the news, on April 17, 2024, an event erupted at Columbia University in New York, where students protested against Israel and in support of Palestine. The incident was sparked by Columbia University President Minush Shafik's testimony in Congress regarding the presence of anti-Semitism on campus, which led to hundreds of students initiating protests both on and off campus. Various student organizations such as pro-Palestinian groups, Jewish Voice for Peace, Students for Justice in Palestine, and Columbia University Apartheid Divest, joined forces to organize the protests on the Eastern Lawn. Following this, universities across the United States also responded with actions, including mass protests and camping activities at institutions such as MIT and NYU. Apart from Columbia University, at least 60 Yale University students supporting Palestine and at least 150 NYU students were arrested on the 22nd. 108 students from Emerson College were also arrested. Harvard University even announced the dissolution of pro-Palestinian student organizations on the 22nd. As to whether this action was correct, we cannot provide a definitive answer. However, some have likened this event to the Red Guards of the Cultural Revolution in the United States. So let's examine whether these two events have any similarities. First, let's rewind to June 1966 in Communist China. The Cultural Revolution began initiating the Red Guard movement among young people, a mass organization formed under the dominance of extreme leftist ideology. These young people were seen as the most reliable allies by Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, as they were naive, easily manipulated, and prone to confrontation. Most importantly, they were eager for adventure and action. We have to rely on these kids to rebel and revolutionize, Otherwise we can't overthrow these demons and monsters, Mao Zedong reportedly told his doctor. So on August 1st, Mao Zedong sent a private note of support to a group of young people from the affiliated high school of Tsinghua University, expressing his support. Rebellion is justified, Mao reportedly told them. On August 8th, the radio broadcasted the guidelines of the Cultural Revolution, stating that university students, vocational school students, middle school students, and elementary school students were all exempt from punishment. Two months later, these students had already formed organizations called Red Guards. It wasn't just them. Students from other parts of Beijing also gathered and formed organizations called Red Flags, or East Wind. All these students were inspired by a widely circulated letter, written by Mao Zedong to Lin Biao, which strongly advocated for the integration of the people with the army, learning military skills alongside daily work, following the paradigm set decades earlier during the Yan'an era. However, the work teams of the Chinese Communist Party did not allow the formation of organizations without official recognition. The only recognized organizations were the Communist Party, the Communist Youth League, and the Young Pioneers. At that time, Orders were given for the inexperienced Red Guards to disband. However, after Mao Zedong's approval, the Red Guards rose again. They swore to defend Chairman Mao and his revolution to the death, considering themselves loyal soldiers of Mao Zedong and began wearing military uniforms. Generally, well-fitting uniforms and neat attire were considered bourgeois dressing and would evoke dissatisfaction. Belts were essential, convenient for whipping class enemies. Finally, they would wear a complete set of uniforms, topped with a red cotton armband with the golden words, Red Guards. The first group of young people who organized the Red Guards and were praised by Mao Zedong were all students from the elite middle school affiliated with Tsinghua University. Without exception, they were all children of high-ranking officials and military officers. They knew from their parents that there were revisionist elements within the Communist Party who were anti-Mao Zedong. These students grew up in a political environment full of intrigue and were able to access classified information through channels unavailable to others. In fact, there were also classes within the Red Guards. 
Many believed that only those with the purest lineage could become true Red Guards, namely the children of senior revolutionaries. They believed that they were born into this world to oppose the bourgeois and carry the banner of the great proletarian revolution. Sons must inherit the power their fathers obtained. This is called the hereditary transmission of power. A hero's son is a good man. A reactionary's son is a bastard. Less than one-fifth of Beijing high school students qualified to enter this strictly controlled group based on lineage. You see? The idea of hereditary power succession is just the same old autocratic rule, isn't it? It has nothing to do with the proletariat. What did they do? As soon as the Red Guards heard Mao Zedong's slogan, Rebellion is Justified, they immediately began attacking teachers and principals. On August 4, three days after students from the affiliated high school of Qinghu University received Mao Zedong's letter of encouragement, they forced the principal and vice principal to wear signs that read, Gang Leaders. Over the next few days, the Red Guards took turns beating them, some using clubs, some choosing whips or brass buckled belts. Even the vice principal's hair was burnt. On August 13, a mass gathering was held at the workers' stadium, where five civilians who had previously intimidated the Red Guards were brought onto the stage in front of tens of thousands of students. They were denounced as thugs and subjected not only to beatings but also to lashings with belts. Zhou Enlai, who presided over this struggle session, made no effort to stop these violent acts, evidently endorsing them publicly. On August 18, more than a million young students surged into Tiananmen Square. The Red Guards arrived at the square before dawn. Some were issued red silk armbands, replacing their homemade cotton ones. As the radiant sun rose in the eastern sky of the square, Mao Zedong, dressed in loosely fitting military attire, descended from the platform and shook hands with them. Then Lin Biao delivered a lengthy speech, urging the excited and passionate young people present to completely destroy all the old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits of the exploiting classes. A Red Guard later reflected on initially being shocked by the violence erupting in schools, but soon experienced the gruesome reality firsthand. When I first started hitting people, I didn't know what to do. I was weak. But soon I could hit harder than other students. No matter how hard you hit, I would hit harder, like a beast, until my fists hurt. Children were at their most vicious then. For some, beating class enemies into unrecognizable forms was like playing a game, much like fighting crickets. The Red Guards in Beijing were purging class enemies, vowing to make Beijing more deeply rooted and red. Elderly people wore placards around their necks, their arms bound with ropes, paraded through the streets as a spectacle. Shortly after, a large number of ragged individuals were sent to the countryside from Beijing Railway Station. These victims numbered around 77,000, slightly less than 2% of the total population. The most severe killings occurred in the outskirts of Beijing. Local officials in Daxing County ordered the elimination of all landlords and other bad elements, including their descendants. These officials claimed rumors suggested class enemies were about to retaliate forcefully, overthrow local party branches, and kill those who had tormented them in the past. How deep was the destruction wrought by the Red Guards? There's no exact tally of victims in Beijing, but in late August, over a hundred people were killed daily. An internal Communist Party document revealed 126 deaths at the hands of the Red Guards on August 26 to 28 the next day. 184 the day after, and 200 on August 29th. By a conservative estimate, by late September, at least 1,770 had perished in the initial wave of violence, not including those slaughtered in the outskirts of Beijing. However, being used as a political tool meant being disposable. On July 28, 1967, Mao Zedong urgently summoned the so-called five big leaders of the Beijing Red Guards, already determined to oust the radical factions of the Red Guards from the political stage. By October 1979, the Red Guards organization was officially dissolved by the Communist Party Central Committee. Returning to the present day, many universities have responded to such unforeseen events. For instance, 
Harvard University began limiting protests to outdoor spaces starting from this spring semester. American University in Washington, D.C. implemented a ban on indoor protests starting in January of this year. Additionally, New York University, Brown University, and MIT have each introduced new regulations to adjust the balance between free speech and campus order. At Columbia University, student protests demanding divestment from Israeli arms-related companies sparked widespread responses, leading to class cancellations in New York and other cities. During a visit to the Columbia University campus, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, accompanied by some Republican members of Congress, was heckled by pro-Palestinian protesters and faced demands for the university president's resignation. Johnson condemned the demonstrations as mob rule and criticized what he perceived as the spread of anti-Semitic sentiments throughout universities nationwide. He emphasized, this is abhorrent because Colombia allows these lawless agitators and radicals to take control. If this situation is not quickly contained, if these threats and intimidations do not cease, then the National Guard should be called in. Do you believe this is a consequence of American universities being too left-leaning in their education? It has also been revealed that financial tycoon Soros funds anti-Semitic students. What do you think his purpose is?